Thanks very much, and you declared my conflict of interest, so I appreciate that because we're uh, running against time, I see, and uh, I'm going to try and make up a little bit of time so that we get the best value out of the coffee cart as opposed to our uh, presentations this morning. But we have had some great presentations and I've really enjoyed the opportunity to, uh, to listen to folks. I did want to particularly uh, acknowledge uh, that we do a lot of work here in uh, West Australia with the West Australian Government with uh, Country Health. Thanks, uh, Neil, for that. That partnership is very important to the Royal Flying Doctor Service, as is our, our Commonwealth partnership. But I think I particularly wanted to acknowledge too that uh, we have some really treasured leadership in uh, Susie, the CEO of the uh, National Rural Health Alliance, and in Jenny May, who are going to carry forward a lot of these uh, arguments that we're putting forward. And I think our task is to is to really get behind them. Uh, I also think, though, uh, that we've got a lot of we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I join others in acknowledging that uh, we're here on uh, Indigenous lands, and I pay my respects to elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. In the interests of time, I also thought I'd give you a quick spoiler alert. So yes, we're here to talk about the uh, Best for the Bush report and the series of reports now that the Royal Flying Doctor Service has put out. But the short story is one that sadly we know uh, too well. Remote Australians have poorer health. And we say that easily. What it means is people die earlier and suffer more. And that's not fair. That's, that's a social contract that's being broken. These are the people that mine our minerals, farm our fibres and food, uh, tend our traditional lands. And I think as a community, we're letting them down. Uh, they also have less access to health care, which will make, uh, illustrate some numbers later on, and they have less spent per capita on their health care. And that's really, I think, the, the challenge for us ahead, and that's really uh, one of the main reasons why we produce these, these Best for the Bush reports. Uh, I know Sophie, who's in the room over there, asked me specifically to show you that we've got these reports, and I think you're going to be uh, given them uh, some of them at least on your way out if you're quick. I acknowledge my colleague Zoe uh, Schofield too, who's uh, one, of, one of our key researchers, and in particular the lead researcher of the uh, Best for the Bush uh, oral health report that I'll talk to uh, in a little minute because I'm going to give you a little preview and I might even uh, focus on that. So our Best for the Bush reports bring uh, forward a lot of information that's on the public record, uh, but also brings together a lot of our uh, service delivery information. And uh, the Flying Doctor Service, if you want to sneak a peek at your phone rather than uh, put your phone away, search RFDS radar flight map uh, just while you're sitting there. As I uh, prepared to come up here, there are, I think, 13 of our 80 aircraft in the air, including a helicopter here in uh, Western Australia. You can always see that there's uh, a lot of things happening in the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, world, uh, which reflects the state of the, the health of the nation. The headlines of the reports, which I so warmly held up twice now uh, for Sophie's benefit, uh, the, the headlines of the report, as I said, are, are headlines that, that we know. Uh, on our numbers, uh, these are around 2021, 20, I, th I think, uh, we know that uh, people in remote areas of Australia are going to die more than 14 years earlier. Women 16, men uh, 13 years. And that, that's a gap that I think in this day and age is and should be completely unacceptable. Just as importantly, we know that from our work in aeromedical retrieval, which is a lot of the work that the Royal Flying Doctor Service is best known for, when we look at the reasons why we're taking people to uh, tertiary hospitals from remote locations. Uh, we see that uh, those folks in remote Australia are up to three times more likely to be taken to hospital. And most importantly, uh, that's being taken to hospital for illnesses that uh, are and should be preventable. So for preventable illnesses. You can imagine unmanaged cardiovascular disease, unmanaged heart disease and other things. We also take a look in the um, in the numbers that we have available to us at where people have access to local services. And we find uh, through our geographical analysis 
that there are many, many Australians taking the Institute of Health and Welfare's one-hour drive time as a sort of rough proxy for access. There are many Australians that do simply do not have access to uh, any physical health services uh, within an hour's drive time. Now, we're not advocating that everybody should have every service within an hour's drive time. I think this is just an interesting proxy, though. What uh, we've heard uh, earlier already from um, Susie is that we've got to have a conversation, I think, about what ought we expect to be a reasonable uh, level of care. What should we be expecting uh, for folks living in rural and remote Australia uh, is a reasonable standard of care and the things that people should be getting to. But the other reason I, I give these uh, numbers, which, which, as you see, uh, I think are actually quite manageable numbers on the face of it. On the face of it, this is actually a surmountable problem. And I'd like to put to you later on that I think it's largely a problem of planning and resource allocation. Uh, it's, not a pro uh, it's not a problem of vision. We don't lack vision. What we lack, I think, is the ability. We, we literally know where these people live in the vast majority of cases. We know who they are. We could make a plan to deliver the health care that they're missing out on, on an individual basis. And then our services could rally around those plans and play our part in delivering the essential services that people need. Uh, we cite in our Best for the Bush report uh, the evidence that comes from the National Rural Health Alliance uh, through their work with NAUS that documents that underspending. So in a, in a budget that is huge, uh, 220 plus million dollars and eight thousand dollars a year in uh, funding uh, we know that rural and remote rural and remote Australians uh, have less spent on their care and the gap in this case in this uh, report is six and a half billion dollars so I'm really encouraged to see that the National Rural Health Alliance is being ambitious about our ask we shouldn't be I think uh, too humble and backward in coming forward to say uh, this really needs to be addressed. Now, I'm acutely aware that the Royal Flying Doctor Service is an organisation that is very well supported by governments. We're well supported by the Commonwealth Government. Uh, we're well supported by state governments. We're well supported by the Australian public. But to put that gap into some sort of perspective, you could establish 65 Royal Flying Doctor Services and not, close, and not close that gap. You could double the funding to the Royal Flying Doctor Service and that gap would move from 6.5 billion to 6.4 billion on an annual budget. So I think the scale of the problem that we have is something we need to be talking about uh, much, much more. Uh, we know in particular that we don't want, ultimately, a retrieval service like the Royal Flying Doctor Service to be uh, spending all of its time focused on what are ultimately, in large measure, perhaps apart from some of the accidents, uh, are failures of the primary health system. So if primary health care was doing all the things that it needed to do, we would have fewer retrievals. There'd be fewer aircraft in the air as we speak. So people are often less aware that the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, now delivers uh, very large quantities of uh, primary health care. We run clinics across the country, uh, something like north of 300,000 patient contacts uh, per year. And we would like very much to be focused much more on that, on that work. In our current arrangement with the Commonwealth, uh, ironically somewhat, we, we get a block grant, for want of a better description, that is built around activity. It's built around the retrieval activity on the one side and the primary health care activity on the other side. In the last year of the Best for the Bush report, we saw a 9% increase in our aeromedical retrieval services, which of course must and will remain our first priority. We're delivering people who are in trouble uh, to tertiary hospitals for uh, often acute acute care. But what that means under our current arrangements is that most of that funding is removed then from our primary health services. So ironically, 
uh, we end up delivering less primary health services so that we can deliver more emergency retrievals. And that's got to stop. I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, and again, acutely aware that we're trying to make up some time, uh, a little bit about some of the services that you'll know us for and some that you won't. And I have a picture on the screen there of a RFDS medical chest. Hands up if you're aware of an RFDS medical chest. I thought so. So that's uh, essentially a locked box of uh, medications that can be, you know, break glass in emergency, uh, can be opened when somebody uh, needs particular care and they get access to some controlled uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals and uh, through uh, telephone support, uh, somebody who's had a, an issue can be uh, administered a drug that they might uh, need. Some 3,000 of them or more are scattered across the country. But I wanted to talk about uh, the facility at William Creek that, that opened recently because in some ways I, I actually describe it as a sort of an advanced form of a medical chest. And we'll come to this business of workforce later, but the facility at medical chest is, uh, uh, the facility at William Creek is an unstaffed medical facility. It's about halfway between Alice Springs and Adelaide. So if you're going from Adelaide, it's about 850 kilometres north. If you're going from Alice Springs, it's about 800 kilometres uh, south. And what you have at that facility is the ability for a patient to come and ring the doorbell, as they did in the two weeks after it, after it opened. A patient came, rang the doorbell with their family, concerned that they were having a stroke. They, uh, the doors open remotely and they're admitted into a, uh, into a room that has a telemedicine console. They can be hooked up to various uh, 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 instruments and they receive a telemedicine consult via a screen uh, directly in front of them. If required, there's one of the old medical chests sitting in the corner and they can have access to uh, drugs as they need it. The case that I'm talking about, the person uh, rang the doorbell with their family, uh, were admitted concerned that they had a stroke, uh, were having a stroke. Turns out they had a consultation with the GP, a consultation with a neurologist who were based in Adelaide Hospital and were diagnosed definitively with Bell's palsy. What that meant for the, the Flying Doctor Service is that we didn't need to deploy what would have been a twin engine jet coming from Adelaide, uh, 800 kilometres out, with essentially an intensive care crew and equipment on board, who would have then made the return journey. What it meant for the family, of course, and for the patient, is that they received the comfort of an early diagnosis and didn't have to go through all that uh, trauma of evacuation uh, unnecessarily. I want to talk briefly about the upcoming uh, Oral Health Report, which is the next series of the uh, Royal Flying Doctor Best of the Bush Report. And Zoe Schofield, who's sitting there smiling, she's smiling because she's the principal author of the report. Uh, and she's saying, great, it's about to be released because we've, uh, we've been through quite a process to, to get it written. It's collecting some new information uh, for us. Folks are often unaware that I think in the last year, the Royal Flying Doctor Service delivered something like 55,000 uh, occasions of care. Uh, across the country in clinics that are, are carted around in uh, dental buses and trucks, uh, conducted in uh, clinics that happen in other places. I, sh I should have said when I showed you the William Creek facility, there are also uh, clinical rooms in the William Creek facility that mean visiting clinicians of all varieties and from any service, uh, if they're coming through town, have uh, uh, have access to clinical rooms that they can use to conduct uh, various consultations with their allied health professionals and others. I should say in William Creek, for instance, uh, that, that means that, um, amongst other things, uh, somebody who's seeking alcohol and drug counselling doesn't have to do that in the back room of the pub. A woman who might be requiring a pap smear doesn't have to do that in the back room of the pub. So I think we're going to see these sort of virtual facilities scattered all over the place. Uh, as we see the 55,000 occasions of dental care delivered, we've also observed, though, that there's actually a decline in the use of the services by children and people uh, of the age uh, uh, 5 to 12. 
and low uptake even in teenagers, notwithstanding the fact that we know how impactful uh, dental health services are on people's general health services. We're still stuck in this model where dental health services are treated separately to primary health care services. Our doctors can look at your tonsils, but not your teeth. Um, to give you a couple of quick uh, highlights from, uh, from this report, as I said, uh, coming soon, uh, the, uh, the key findings of the report relate to the fact that in rural and remote Australia, we're seeing twice the rate of poor oral health as our city counterparts. And what that means for a service like the Royal Flying Doctor Service, in our estimate, is that that's creating about 10 aeromedical retrievals per week. Unnecessary aeromedical retrievals because people's oral health has either uh, progressed to a critical stage or has contributed to other health conditions. As I said, we're seeing uh, oral health and primary health care delivered separately and under different uh, models of care. And we're really seeing this wrestling match where, in short, we're sort of seeing urban models of care somewhat adapted to be delivered in remote locations rather than uh, remote care being delivered from the ground up as remote services appropriate to type rather than uh, squeezing into a, a, an inappropriate sort of framing. The key recommendations that we're going to make out of this report are that uh, our new National Oral Health Plan, which I believe is on the way, uh, we've seen the Commonwealth Government conduct its investigation, uh, really needs to be underpinned by principles of universal and equitable uh, access. We need to be focused on a population health approach and services need to be integrated into primary health care. Importantly, we need to include specific and separately funded rural and remote implementation plan. I think this goes to the point uh, Susie made so well earlier, that unless we have some specific initiatives around rural and remote uh, health care, then we're just going to get lost in the bundle. Uh, you can read the, uh, all of the reports of the, uh, all, all of the recommendations of the Best for the Bush report, and, it, and in short, they have a very, very strong overlap with the rec sorts of recommendations that we're seeing uh, the Rural Health Alliance make. The short version of those recommendations is that we need an extra $6 billion to be spent on rural and remote health. And I'm very delighted that Jenny and Susie, over the next, I don't know, you are be seeing yourself 12-month goals or longer-term goals, but uh, under the leadership of Jenny and Susie, we're going to see that uh, happen. And I think our task is to uh, rally behind all of that. Uh, partly to achieve that, what we need to do is to come to some sort of access or agreed definition of what reasonable care might mean. What is, what is the reasonable expectation that somebody living in remote and regional Australia can have for access to care? And that can be adjusted and might look different according to age and demographics. It might look different according to geographics. It might look uh, different according to community circumstances. But I just want to stress, until you actually have a definition of a reasonable standard of care, then how can you determine whether you're delivering the appropriate care. After that, I think it becomes easier because we have individual service plans that can roll out that care. And our services, however they're uh, uh, funded and created and driven, uh, then become uh, servants of those individual uh, healthcare plans. I also think, and the language is not quite the same as this in the, in the report as I'll say now, but I also think we need to essentially abandon this idea of markets and market failure. I just don't think it's an appropriate model for uh, rural and remote healthcare, and we're not dealing with markets. I was a very bad student at university, but I did do some economics, and my bad explanation of economics is that if you have demand and you don't have enough supply, then the price goes up until supply meets demand. 
That's not what we're talking about, I presume, when we talk to governments about solving markets in uh, rural and remote parts of Australia, because if that was the problem, it'd be easy. The price would go up, the price would go up, the price would go up until supply meets demand. We're talking about something else. I think we're talking about the need to be efficient and effective and creative in the way that we deliver uh, plans. I think, as I've said, these are surmountable problems. Even with the big number, even seven million people is a surmountable uh, problem. If we start where we need the care most, if we start with the populations who need the care most, if we start delivering the services where we think we can make the biggest difference early and work our way out from those uh, problems, then I think we have an opportunity to make a very big difference and I think we have an opportunity to actually be optimistic about the sorts of changes that we could achieve. I'd encourage you to both read the uh, Best for the Bush report and if it's any additional incentive, come to the RFDS coffee cart and you'll get not just a coffee, but if you're quick, you might get a copy of the report as well. Thanks very much.